Let's give him a hand and good luck, Mort. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Sorry. So, hi, everybody. I'm very glad to be here today to share with you all the findings that we came across uh, with my team uh, when we started analyzing the HID uh, two factor application. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, now it's three months ago that we decided to go for this security analysis. So, yeah, I'm particularly excited to show you today all the interesting stuff that are implemented inside this type of application. So, uh, for that, I'm going to follow the, this agenda. There is mainly four parts. Uh, the three first one are here just to lay the ground for the last one, because the interesting, as you can guess here, the interesting points um, are in the last one. So before that, I hope to uh, uh, present you some uh, some uh, some key points that will help you to understand all the overview of uh, of the analysis. So the first part uh, consists mainly to, uh, in introducing the application, how it does it, how, how does it work, uh, what is the, the infrastructure that is generally used to implement this kind of application. Then I'll move to the overall methodology that I followed all over the analysis to uh, to gather the the information for for for, for, for this analysis. And um, ah, I think this is also an interesting one. I will just show you all the security mechanisms that were deployed by the application to protect yourself. It's very interesting here to see how uh, this kind of application are protecting, uh, let's say, their uh, intellectual property. Oh, the first part. Uh, I think everybody here is, is very familiar with the hardware token. So I think I guess that at least one uh, of you are using this kind of application. So here you have a hardware token that uh, an end user is uh, using to generate a one-time password. So uh, this is uh, embedded in a hardware device. So uh, yeah, we can uh, till now uh, understand how things are implemented behind the scene. But yeah, the user here just getting a, a one-time password and send it with uh, its uh, login and password to the a VPN gateway or whatever you want, something that will authenticate you against a remote infrastructure. And the idea there is to have an access to your internal network. So now take the hardware part and replace it with a software part. Uh, for our case, we are talking about HAD, HAD logo uh, that you can see here uh, each time. So the, the end user here is going to use a mobile phone as a device to authenticate himself against uh, an authentication uh, uh, gateway. So uh, the application will be installed on a mobile device here. Each ID can be installed on uh, different flavors as uh, Windows Phone, BlackBerry, iPhone, and Android OS. Uh, again, here the end user just grab a one-time password from the application. So the HID pop-ups uh, uh, pop uh, an information here that you can see, and the end user can get the one-time password and send it again with his uh, login and, uh, and the password to the VPN gateway, as I uh, show here. So uh, for our study, as I uh, previously show here, uh, there is many flavor of the application. For our study, we decide to focus only on uh, the Android one. But I, uh, but I am telling you also that uh, we decided after to go for the other operating system just to compare the result that we obtained during our analysis regarding the, the Android version. Uh, yeah, um, and as you know, uh, the Android market is the only market that offers the possibility to get rapidly and efficiently an application package as the opposite of the other stores. If you one day decided to go to for a Microsoft store to grab an application, it's not that easy as you can uh, think. Yeah, so we decided to go for the Android version. Um, uh, the main risk that we wanted to assess here was to uh, check if an attacker who, have, who has the ability to go and steal the device, 
uh, to assess the risk if, it is, if it is the attacker is able then to uh, stall all the configuration files that belong to the application and replay them without having any secrets. So that was the major risk that we wanted to assess. And uh, consequently, uh, we, uh, we wanted also to know how the, how the application protects itself against all uh, reverse engineering mechanisms, how the, how the application identifies itself that, is, uh, that it is running under uh, uh, root, uh, rooted devices and so on. So that is uh, our main uh, objectives. But before that, all I want to show you now is just uh, a brief quick, uh, overview uh, on how the application is used on a daily basis, on real life. So once the user uh, grabs the application, install it on its uh, mobile device, and in our case, uh, uh, Android One, uh, he, uh, he has to start it for the first time. The application uh, should uh, talk with uh, a second part. Uh, the second part here is uh, the smart token management portal. So uh, this component com comes into play to ensure the enrollment process. Uh, so the user, for the first time, um, get a serial number that the application generates for the fir uh, during the first execu execution. The user, as you can guess here, manually has to achieve all the enrollment process. So he takes the serial number and send it to the management portal. The management portal then uh, generates an activation code and the user again get this activation code and uh, submit it to the application. And finally, the user uh, get a, registr a registration code that he has to send to the, the final application to terminate all the enrollment process. As you can see here, there is no internet or network connection between the two components. Uh, all the stuff uh, is carried out uh, manually. So. Uh, when we started our analysis, we, the first thing that we, uh, we started digging in, in it, it, it was studying the, let's say, the security mechanism that the vendor itself promotes during, uh, in, his, in its communication uh, uh, documents. And here is uh, some uh, security uh, means that normally are deployed and implemented into the application. But for us, what is the most interesting is uh, the first one. So uh, it appears that the application uh, has some several uh, mechanisms against reverse engineering. So uh, they deployed all uh, obfuscation uh, techniques and symbol stripping to uh, remove all the information that can attacker grab during its analysis. So when we see something like this, we prepare uh, ourselves psychologically to, uh, to, to deal with this kind of application. And the second point that I want to underline here is uh, other means. So normally the application should not work under a jailbroken or a rooted device. So that's the first observation. Unfortunately, when we started our analysis, the first step simply failed because the application uh, uh, ran uh, normally under uh, an Android emulator, for instance. We carry on our uh, uh, our agenda. So here I uh, just presenting uh, the global methodology that I followed during the analysis. Uh, nothing new here. So two uh, two main components, two main phases. I can uh, I go uh, back and forth between two uh, uh, two main uh, techniques. Code analysis. So here I mainly used IDA Pro uh, for uh, reading the Java bytecode and for debugging the Java bytecode. Uh, but as you know, there is a plethora of tools that you can uh, use uh, for this kind of, uh, of techniques. And the second technique is the behavioral analysis. So the idea here is just to run the application and grab all the logs and the information that the application can generate under an emulator, for instance, here, and try to analyze all these, uh, all these uh, logs. So the main result that we should mention here is that, firstly, the application creates two configuration files the OTP token device and the OTP token status, and uh, massively use uh, crypto functions, uh, especially EAS operations. Um, this result was obtained by uh, Droidbox, uh, a dynamic analysis tools. So yeah, from here, when we came across this uh, observation, we stopped and we uh, told our, uh, our customer that 
Yeah, indeed, there is a problem with this application because uh, it uses all your, always the same uh, encryption key uh, for its EES operations. And whatever the package we downloaded from the market store, we always found these keys. So we stopped here and yeah, we decided to go deeper and further uh, into this analysis. So we opened the box and the first thing we, uh, we faced it up was the, the security mechanism that was uh, used by uh, the application to protect itself. The first one, the first mechanism was the, um, the, 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 the name of fustication. So it's a simple mechanism, but it can be very, very hard for an analyst, an analyst to, uh, uh, to, get, uh, to, to deal with this kind of, uh, of techniques. The idea is very simple here. We just replace all the meaningful information that uh, can be embedded into an application by, uh, by uh, non-meaningful -meaning uh, names, as you can see here, and why not using uni Unicode uh, characters. So reading this kind of code, I can uh, assure you that is very, very uh, hard. Um, yeah, and the idea here uh, is um, my my main work consisted in uh, translating these uh, these these names into something that has a, has a meaning uh, in, inside it. So uh, yeah, so I refactor it all uh, the code to to have something like this. So that was the first mechanism. Then it comes uh, the string obfuscation, a simple uh, simple thing uh, also here, nothing new. The application tries to protect itself by, by uh, hiding all its uh, strings. Um, uh, actually, when we started looking for some special strings as those that are related to the uh, application configuration file, as here the UTP uh, token device, uh, we didn't find them in the application, and uh, yeah, we we started guessing that uh, there is a kind of mechanism of uh, the, uh, this kind of mechanism was uh, really uh, implemented by the application. At the opposite, when we started filtering all the strings that were embedded in the application, we came across uh, some interesting ones. Those ones uh, that are uh, strings uh, that um, um, reveal the use of some crypto crypto cryptographic functions. And by, uh, by digging into the internet and by comparing the code, we, ca we, we, uh, we found out that uh, it was the Buncee Council uh, library that we was used by the application. And that helped us uh, to uh, refactor uh, a, big, uh, a big part of the application. Uh, yeah, to mitigate this kind of techniques, nothing new. Uh, also here, just we have we spotted the function that was in charge to uh, decrypt all the strings. Uh, we wrote we we wrote uh, an IDC script uh, under Ida, who grabs all the output of these scripts. So here, as you can see uh, at your right, uh, on your right, you can see all the strings that we can uh, that we were able to grab uh, during a simple execution of the application. And uh, here we were a little bit happy because we saw something inter we saw new things that were interesting, interesting for us, especially the use of the standard Java API. So here we, we are sure that we can break somewhere to get more information. That was the second main. The third one was uh, the Java reflection, another layer of obfuscation. This one, yeah, uh, when you 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 come across this one easily when you start reading the code each time you try to follow a, a call of a function you just uh, you have a, a wall in front of you because uh, instead of using just a direct call the application is using three call to 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 call one uh, to to achieve one application and yeah so the java reflection techniques is just the property of a class to inspect itself and uh, to have the ability to call a method or, or, or to modify an attribute of this class but by inspecting itself. And generally, we use uh, three, three APIs uh, for name, get method, and invoke APIs to, uh, to implement this kind of techniques. So uh, here are the mitigations. Uh, yeah, no real mitigations, just using IDA Pro to spot this kind of, uh, of techniques and deal and we live with, with that. And uh, during the analysis, we spotted uh, all the, 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 the meaning of each function and we refactor, we rename all, uh, each function. And finally, uh, yeah, the most inter interesting one was the class encryption mechanism. So uh, the application, 
uh, actually embedded in itself uh, two airway, two byte airways that uh, uh, that corresponded to the real functional application. So uh, when you start reading the, uh, let's say the, the the Android application, the code of the Android application, there is nothing interesting in in that portion of code. But when you when you arrive at this level of uh, of mechanism, you start under understanding. Uh, the things that uh, are behind the scene because the application starts to decrypt a part of the application and this part corresponds to the real functional application. That was the first point. The second point is, uh, yeah, um, uh, it uh, generally use the same encryp EUS encryption key and IV uh, airway to decrypt and encrypt uh, this airway. So whatever the package that you uh, download from the market store, Android Microsoft, you will always uh, end with this uh, with these two air airways that correspond to the encryption keys you used by EES uh, for its uh, decryption uh, process. So for uh, for the mitigation. Uh, what we done here, um, just remember the result that we I'm displaying here is the result of the string deobfuscation uh, phase that uh, came just before. Uh, and uh, when we read all the strings, the order is very important because the order uh, reflects the order of the, the execution of the application. So we can easily spot the use of a cryptographic function, and then we can just break uh, at the right moment, uh, and especially here, the moment where the application will start to decrypt itself. So we can stop there and dump all the content from the memory. And here again, we come across uh, we, uh, with a, a, a Java byte, a uh, little bit obfuscated, but we can deobfuscate it easily and start reading the go. So at this level, we, we had we dealt with all the security mechanism and we are able to start reading the code. Yeah, just reading the code, we'll probably debugging it and uh, trying to understand how things work behind. So the end part is the for me is the most important one. So uh, once we had the code, we uh, we asked ourselves, what are we looking for now? Really, we are looking for something like this because uh, the algorithm used for generating one-time password is a, it's a, it's a standard algorithm. It's not something uh, new. It's not something obscure. It's something known by everybody. So we just took the RFC here and tried to understand the content of the RFC and uh, yeah, uh, draw this kind of schema to try to understand how, what what are we looking for. So. Uh, for our case, we are trying to find portion of code that implements this kind of, of, of algorithm. So, what we have here to understand the logic, we have uh, various elements. The first uh, one regard the, you remember the decrypted airway that contain the functional, the application functional code. And we have something that we got from the behavioral analysis. We know that the application use mainly two configuration files. So for us, the main entry point will be the two configuration files. So we are going to start from this file, trust back all the elements that, uh, that deal with this file, all the mechanism and the functions that uh, manipulate these files to, to find uh, how the application works. The first step that we uh, carry out, uh, carried out was just to uh, uh, find how the application read and write to these files. And for that, we wrote uh, a proof of concept. So we, re we read the Java code. Uh, uh, and we uh, decided to write a proof of concept to understand how things work. And at the end, we had uh, our proper parser of these uh, two files. So uh, here uh, at the bottom, you have the first file, which is the OTP token device, and the second file, which is the OTP device status. Now I'm telling you that the first, the, the most important one is the bottom one, and the second one is is, is, uh, is not such as important as the first one. And uh, the methodology here is uh, what I what I did really in real life. I took every parameter, every line. So I took the first one, the second one, and so on, and started 
try tracing back each parameter and uh, trying to understand how the application generates these parameters and how the application uses these parameter, parameters when it reads the configuration file. So uh, it was a really tough work, but here, uh, what I put in red uh, is the result of my study. Uh, that corresponds of the most important one. So we are going now to trace back all these red parameters to understand uh, how the application works. So, uh, yeah, that was the kind of code that we had, we I had to deal with uh, uh, the first day. Something unreadable. I don't know if someone here is able to read this kind of code. But after Eliminating all the obfuscation mechanism, refactoring the code, we came to something like this. And this time, we can see that it's very easy to read the code and understand what is behind the scene. So from now, the main work was just reading the code and uh, understand how things work. For us, uh, the entry point, as I told you, was the OTP uh, token device. So I, we, we took this file and we started analyzing each parameter. Uh, the third red parameter, you remember, uh, was stored in this kind of file. And it seems that this, this parameter is uh, the, the one-time the, the one password key which is encrypted using a 3 ds uh, algorithm. So here we have the one, one uh, sorry, you have the one-time uh, key uh, that is submitted to triple ds and the encrypted form is uh, is uh, stored into this file. Um, yeah, so we, that's the first finding. Now we are going to trust back the, the, the one-time key uh, to understand how uh, how this key is generated. So be careful here. Um, previously, uh, I'm mentioning here that the key OTP is about 24 bytes. But in uh, in reality, the key is split into two main parts. One part corresponds to 20 bytes, and the second uh, corresponds to four bytes. And the four bytes are generated using, yeah, firstly, I call this function get random because uh, I just reading the code quickly, I thought that is something generating something random. But in real life, it was not such as random because it just took um, the current time in millisecond and um, uh, use um, and uh, uh, implement a SHA-1 on the on this seed and extract four, four bytes from this uh, from this uh, from this result. So here, if, uh, if you can say, yes, this function is kind of deterministic. If you have the same, the, the same current time millisecond each time, we can get each time the same four bytes. Just make this information uh, here, and, and we will come back to, to that. So I carry on. Once we have uh, these four bytes, uh, the idea here is to see how the 20, 20 uh, bytes that we have at the beginning are generated. Uh, so the, the schema here uh, shows you that yeah, the application is using pbkdf2 to, uh, to generate these uh, 20 bytes using the activation code. And uh, remember, the activation code is uh, something that is generated by the server. And it's also using the salt, uh, which is derived from the serial number. So also here, the function that, is, that generates the salt is the, the deterministic function that uh, takes uh, the serial number and generates uh, the same value uh, each time. OK. Now, so we saw the, the key OTP part. What is interesting to see now, the key I uh, part here, the, so the key that is used by the application to encrypt the, the key OTP key. Um, yeah, the application is only getting the pbkdf2 algorithm for that, and uh, this time um, the application uses a master key, what I'm calling here a master key, and we are going a little bit further to see how this master key is generated. Yeah, master key. Again, the serial number submitted to the determinist fun deterministic functions to get the key I uh, for the encryption task. So here we can uh, start to, uh, to ask ourselves, where is the pin? Because uh, as, uh, as I told you uh, at the beginning, when the user ends its enrollment process, he should uh, protect all the information using a pin. So where is the pin on, in all this stuff? 
So yeah, the pin is used here to generate the master key. So the pin that can be a digit between four and twelve digits is uh, is submitted to SHA-256 and then encoded with uh, base-64. Uh, the same process is uh, execute is done on the Android ID, and as you know, the Android ID is a security attribute used by Android devices to uh, uniquely identify an, uh, an Android device. Um, and I think that uh, the idea here was to use something that is very specific to each device. But as you know, the Android ID can be modified on an emulator or on an Android device as you like. So we do the same thing on the Android ID, and we get we concatenate, we concatenate uh, the both elements, and we get uh, the master key. So the third vulnerability. Just having this in mind, we can state that an attacker can clone and enroll HID subtoken application. So he had to copy the HID configuration files, the OTP token device and the OTP token status. Uh, and for that, he need uh, a root access on the device. So uh, at this level, you can imagine all the scenario. The attacker has a physical access to the device. He stole the device, he root the device, uh, remotely access the device using a known exploit as you like, but the idea here just to get an access to the configuration file and get them. He has also uh, to get the Android ID uh, for uh, for the victim device. If the attacker has both of this information, he can clone the application and use it. But the problem is the attacker has to have a valid PIN to have a valid one-time password. But because the trick here is that the application generates uh, a value, a one-time value, whatever uh, the, the pin is, uh, is submitted to the application. So, as you can guess here, if the attacker uh, go for a social engineering scenario or try to install a keylogger on the device or something like this, the idea is just to get the pin. If the attacker had the valid pin and satisfies the two prerequisites that I've just underlined here, he can clone the application. So we did the test, and uh, actually the test uh, was okay because we had uh, a valid access to the, to the test platform that we, uh, we were, were using. Okay, so that was the first vulnerability. But the question, as you know, as a researcher, we, we have always questions. If there is another way to get the pin. So, come back to the uh, schema that uh, summarizes the, how the master key is generated, but this time, instead of using the master key as an end result, we are using a variable that I am calling here just uh, uh, something grabbish to, to, to illustrate the, the, the meaning of the variable. And this variable is used in the code, and uh, effectively, the, what's, what's happening, it's... Um, when we, oh, I was reading the code, I came across this portion of code. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I was very happy because the application indeed read, uh, stores the pin uh, in its configuration file using a SHA-256 algorithm. And it was, uh, it was okay. I was very happy, but a few lines uh, after, I identified that the application, this, this code branch is never executed because the application is just in a kind of a flag variable, and this flag is always set to false, and, and this branch code is never executed. So I suspect that there was a time where the pin of the application was stored in SHA-256 in the, in the configuration file. Okay, so here again, fail. So after a cup of coffee or more so with my uh, team, we decided to go and reanalyze all the stuff to spot if there is uh, something interesting to grab the pin code of the, of the application. Because for us, it w it's very class if we can get the pin code from the application itself without going for a social engineering scenario or something like this. Remember? I put all everything in one slide to have a, a big overview of uh, the internal function and fun functionalities of the application. Here you find also the OTP token device, the encrypted uh, key OTP used to generate uh, the one-time password. Here we also we 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 we, we spot the key OTP split in two parts, the 20 bytes and the four bytes. Okay, so here we draw all the stuff in a 
in a, a whiteboard and we started to think where is what we can do here to get the pin. Uh, in fact, the OTP key is 24 bytes. The 20 bytes are generated using PBKDF2 algorithm, but the four bytes that comes at the end of the key OTP are generated using SHA-1 algorithm seeded by the system get current time millisecond. So the idea here, if I get the value that was used to generate the SHA-1 value here, if I get the, the return value of this function, I have the four bytes. And the problem now, from where can I get this value? Because if you take this schema, if I have the correct value of the current time in a millisecond, I can generate the, uh, the, the a four byte here. Uh, if I have the four byte here, I can do a kind of brute force because the the, the pin I don't know I don't know the pin, but but I'm looking for the pin, so I can brute force here the pin by insert it uh, at this at this part. The Android ID, uh, ID value I know this value, so I can redo all this mechanism to have uh, to decrypt the key, but I need somewhere a stop condition for me to stop the brute force. So when I decrypt uh, the triple death encrypted value, I need something to tell me you are on the right way, you have the right key. So the stop condition here is these four bytes. So if I, if I got the five, the four bytes, the, val the valid four bytes, I have my stop condition. If and I have my stop condition, I have my valid pin. But the problem here is where, what is, what was the, the, the value that was used by the application to generate these four bytes? And guess what? In the configuration file, uh, the application stores two values, two timestamps, the beginning of the enrollment process and the end of the enrollment process. So if I have these two values, I can guess where this operation has been carried out between this range of time values. So I have the time values, I can now brute force all the four bytes that are possible because I have the beginning and the end of the process, I can generate all the four bytes. If I have all these four bytes, I can go then for the other side to a brute force attack, submitting all the pins that I want to find, and I have my stop condition. You can guess here that we have some collisions, and the, uh, for that, in consequence, we are going to have uh, a number of candidate pin. And uh, yeah, I will show you after how we can choose the, the, the right one. But yeah, that was the attack that we can trigger to get the pin. So yeah, as I said before, it was our stop condition to uh, trigger a brute force attack and get and get the pin. So here I am showing you uh, the proof of concept that we developed in an in intern to, to demonstrate uh, this attack. So this uh, proof of concept just took uh, as parameter the, 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 the configuration file and based, in, uh, based on the content of this configuration file, he tried to do the brute force. And as you see here, there is a lot of candidates but what we did is just to uh, try to, to, to do a statistical uh, analysis to see uh, which one is uh, the most uh, uh, possible one uh, regarding the, the, the execution of the operation during the time. So to conclude, that was an interesting study in terms of technical challenge and results, as you can see. An attacker now is able to steal the configuration file and uh, retrieve the pin without going for a social engineering or, or stealing the pin. Uh, the study took one month workload, I think. Uh, the vulnerability has been reported to the vendor on July the 19th. And the vendor was very responsive and currently is working on a patch. Um, a patch for this version of the application and at the same of the same time is working for a new design of the application questions
Yeah, yeah, I, I understand the question. So the idea here is was other place that we can get the timestamps. Yeah. So uh, in in our real life, what we did before coming to this uh, to this finding, so we we decided to go for the uh, file configuration creation timestamp. So the first idea idea was that. So we need a time we need we needed a timestamp. So we just went for the time type of the creation of the configuration file and from there we started we started our brute force but with the with having some time to reanalyze all the stuff we we we, we spotted these two values so if we don't have if we didn't have these two values i think that i we uh we will we were able to use the creation file timestamp Did that answer your question? Okay. Any further questions? All right. Well, then I think we should say thank you to Muad. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.